Hi there, my podcast friends. Professor Anthony Swite here from the Department of Church History and Doctrine at Brigham Young University. Welcome to this episode of the Why Religion podcast, our first episode, by the way, for season three. We are so grateful you have joined us and are honored to share this podcast with you. Let's jump right in to today's subject. For centuries, various Christians have viewed Eve as the source of society's problems. She partook of the fruit. She was deceived. She fell. She tempted Adam. She ruined God's paradise for humankind and brought sorrow and suffering in the wake of her weakness. One translation of a Jewish apocryphal book has Adam saying to Eve after she persuaded him to eat the fruit, quote, O wicked woman, what have you done to us? You have deprived me of the glory of God, end of quote. These interpretations of scripture have led some to castigate the entire female populace and sadly have served as a catalyst for a host of inequities perpetrated against women for centuries. Many of the ways that some people view women today are still informed by some of these negative interpretations of Eve. The Latter-day Saint doctrine takes a different view. A revelation canonized in the Doctrine and Covenants calls her, quote, our glorious mother Eve, end of quote. Joseph Smith saw in vision Eve and Adam exalted together in the celestial kingdom of God. And Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Twelve Apostles ranks Eve in his writings right by the side of Mary as one of the greatest of all the children of God. Current General Relief Society President Gene B. Bingham said, quote, we need women who have the courage and vision of our mother Eve, end of quote. Latter-day Saint scriptural and doctrinal interpretations of Eve have not always been this positive, however, and historical Christianity's interpretation haven't always been that negative either. Professor Amy Easton Flake teaches a course on women in scripture, and Professor Mark Ellison has recently published an article on reimagining Eve through early Christian artifacts. They're coming together to be co-interviewed in this episode to teach us more of historical interpretations of Eve. Some of the things that I found were um, that in some of these ancient Christian texts, Eve is depicted as a teacher and an assertive speaker, and she teaches her family, she teaches humanity about the right way, about turning to God, about not turning away from goodness. Adam is created first, and then Eve is created second. And that, of course, is going to open up a whole host of questions for 19th century women, but of course for women today of, okay, well, what, what does that mean? What does that mean for women to be created second? Does that denote um, superiority? Does that denote inferiority? Does that not denote anything? But you will, of course, just have a whole range of people from the very beginning reading this text till now arguing for different positions on what that means. In this episode, get ready to examine what scholars call reception history to understand and perhaps reimagine some of our perceptions of Eve. This is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. I am very excited about this episode with Dr. Ellison and Dr. Easton Flake, particularly as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints begins a new collective study of the Old Testament in 2022, beginning, of course, with our scriptures and stories of Adam and Eve. In part one, they will talk about why our perceptions of Eve matter so much, where those come from, including the creation of Eve and the interpretation of her as a helpmeet. They will also introduce us to and examine some reception history using text and art about early Christian and Latter-day Saint views of Eve. In part two, as usual, they will get a little bit more into application, discussing effective ways to approach scripture as a modern reader, 
And in part three, they will give us some personal views about scripture and how it strengthens them in the restored gospel. So here is Professor Casey Griffiths interviewing BYU ancient scripture professors Amy Easton Flake and Mark Ellison. I am so happy to be here with Amy Easton Flake and Mark Ellison, our guests this week. And I have the opportunity to talk about one of those uh, subjects in the scriptures that it feels like has an endless uh, amount of iteration and discussion that we can go on. And that is uh, Eve within the scriptures. Uh, so, Amy, uh, let, let's start with you a little bit. Um, you've done some good research on Eve in Latter day Saint publications and uh, how Latter-day Saints conceive of and, and think of Eve. Uh, tell us a little bit about your interest in this subject, where it comes from, and what you found. When I first started teaching here at BYU, I spent a lot of time looking at how 19th century women more broadly conceived, especially within their suffrage work, had been using different biblical women. And Eve, of course, and the whole fall and the Garden of Eden and everything was one of those primary topics. And so when I came here to BYU, I started kind of narrowing in that focus to really think about, okay, well, how are Latter-day Saint women using Eve, particularly in the 19th century and in the early 20th century? So how did Latter-day Saint women in the 19th century view Eve? What was different about their approach? So one thing that's very fun about their approach is that they are, of course, coming um, from kind of two different backgrounds. So one, most 19th century women were converts, and so they kind of have a more traditional view of Eve. And to be honest, the traditional view of Eve is very problematic um, in the fact that she is beginning in the medieval period associated with sin, um, with the downfall, of course, of humanity in a way for what came about with the fall and a sexualization of Eve is going to be happening. And so Eve really is just this problematic figure that people are trying to deal with and to work with. 19th century women are having that um, coming into the LDS faith. And yet, of course, as I always like to tell my students, we have Second Nephi 2, um, which is just this beautiful, beautiful understanding that it gives us of the fall. Um, of course, we're also going to get that from other Revelation scripture. But it very much gives us this very positive and uplifting view of Eve. And so one of the most interesting things about the early 19th century and the late 19th century is how you have the LDS women grappling with, okay, well, who is Eve? Mm -hmm. Um, and early church leaders will be kind of across the board. Joseph Smith will say some very positive things about Eve. Brigham Young will say some very negative things about Eve. Um, but it's really going to be in a journal called The Women's Exponent that the women are really going to explore who is Eve um, and what does she mean to me. And they're going to come up with a very, very positive Eve uh, for the most part. And, of course, that positive view of Eve is then going to uh, be kind of reiterated when Joseph F. Smith is going to have his vision where he sees Eve. And from there on, we as a church are always very positive of Eve. But I always find it interesting, and I love talking about with my students, how we really do see kind of the women. Um, and I think because they were looking for role models, and they were looking for role models in the scripture, just as, of course, men were. Um, but they were more interested in saying, okay, what can Eve do for me? So right out of the gate, there's different approaches because of the Book of Mormon, uh, because of the Book of Moses. And I, I, I was thrilled that you mentioned section 138, which is my personal favorite mention of Eve in the scriptures, to see her that those millennia later in the spirit world getting ready to go and preach to the spirits of the dead. Um, a lot of these things are are things that are drawn from Latter-day Saint scripture, but as you were saying, they're, they're taking this Latter-day Saint scripture and then extrapolating on it. So what are some of the specific things that these 19th century Latter-day Saint women say about Eve that are different? I think what we have to grapple with and think about is the fact that we have so many different accounts of this kind of Eden account, right? We have Genesis 1 versus Genesis 2. Then we're going to have reiterations of it in Moses. We're, of course, going to have the temple doing reiterations of this. And so there's so many ways to kind of understand the creation and to understand the fall. Um, and I think that one thing that the scriptures are doing for us in this way is asking us to open up. And not to think that we have this narrow, this is how creation happened. Um, just in the fact that even in all our restoration scriptures, things are happening in different orders. Mm -hmm. I think it's God's way of saying, this is not a play-by-play. -play. This is me trying to teach you these general concepts. Um, so one of the most important things I think that we need to recognize is that we have a difference between Genesis 1 versus Genesis 2. And that difference is going to be very important to 19th century women and women, of course, today, if they recognize it and think about it. 
In Genesis 1, we have a moment where it said, and I actually wanted to read it for us here, in 1, 27, 28, it mm-hmm. says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Um, and so in Genesis 1, we have male and female being created simultaneously. Mm-hmm. And so I bring that up because this account was being often used by 19th century women to argue for the vote um, and to argue for women's general equality. And of course, they're almost always going to use Genesis 1 to say, wait a second, we were created simultaneously with men. And I actually have a beautiful quote by an LDS woman um, named Isabel Horn, who was a leader in the women's suffrage. And she said this, God created us equal. We stood side by side when mankind was created and man has no right to say I am master. God gave our first parents the freedom of the earth and told them to go forth and inhabit the earth. And that kind of rhetoric will just be very similar to what a lot of other um, women who are advocating for the vote for throughout the 19th century are using and saying. And so just one recognizing that distinction between Genesis 1 versus Genesis 2, um, where we'll kind of have more like this ideological tell of, okay, how did mankind fall? How did humanity fall? What happened here? And the, the key difference there in Genesis 2, well, one of the key differences is, um, is going to be the fact that Adam is created first and then Eve is created second. And that, of course, is going to open up a whole host of questions for 19th century women, but of course for women today of, okay, well, what, what does that mean? What does that mean for women to be created second? Does that denote um, superiority? Does that denote inferiority? Does that not denote anything? But you will, of course, just have a whole range of people from the very beginning reading this text till now arguing for different positions on what that means. And one of the one of the discussion points here is the phrase help meet mm-hmm. in scripture. Even the the term is Azur, I believe that's how you say it. Azer, actually. Azer has mm-hmm. has some complexity surrounding it. Can you Paint that for us a little bit. Thank you. That's actually one of my favorite things to discuss. I actually teach a woman in scripture class here at BYU, Mm -hmm. and it's fascinating because these questions matter deeply. They matter to all students, but I feel like they even particularly matter to our female students of wondering, okay, what does all this mean? And so the term azer is an important phrase um, that is often translated as helpmate or helpmeet. But if you actually look at the Hebrew, it actually is just saying help. And the important thing about that term is that there's only two people ever referred to as an Azer in Scripture. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, is going to be God, and that's going to be Eve. Mm. And so right there, that suggests that being an Azer, of course, is not subordinate in any way. Um, It could actually then be superior. But more than anything, it's saying that this is God-like aid that Eve is is bringing to Adam. When we think about being an Azer, we want to think about sustaining, upholding, blessing one another. Um, And so just recognizing that this is not a moment of inferiority in any way for women to be said as an Azer, but instead it's really this beautiful kind of mutuality of, I think, growth. Um, And a lot of the different authors looking at this in the 19th century will say that it actually is saying that actually men and women are not perfect until men and women are both created. That was a point I wanted to bring up, actually, which is it feels like a lot of times um, when we're when we're shifting a narrative, like uh, taking you from this fallen figure who's practically Pandora, you know, introduces mm-hmm. evil uh, to to a more positive positivistic view of her. And we sometimes overcompensate. Like there are texts that talk about how she was deceived and and how she may have made a mistake. Um, do we put Eve on too high a pedestal sometime? And what's the best way to reconcile those two ideas? Well, I think I think it's normal that, of course, people do want to overcompensate, mm-hmm. right? Because we are trying to very much work against a narrative that has honestly been so detrimental yeah. to society. I mean, it has justified misogyny and it's justified women's um, subordination for thousands of years. So I think it is very normal and natural that you're going to see women actually starting as early as the 14th century making these types of arguments to say, wait a second, we really need to rethink how we're understanding this language and what is happening here. What I particularly actually love about my students today is that they are not comfortable with, as you're kind of saying, this kind of overcompensate with Eve. Mm -hmm. Instead, when I talk with my students, they really are so interested in, they want a mutuality, right? They want 
just this level playing field of saying, yes, men and women are equal. We don't need to make Eve superior to Adam. We don't make Adam superior to Eve. And I think that you also see those same kind of moves in different 19th century individuals as they're doing this. But I actually really love that that's what my students want, um, is that. And so I think, kind of to go back to answering your question with that, I think Part of it is it takes a reshifting in our minds and in the way we think about things. Because even though with my students, I'm able to say, oh, you know, if she's an A there, you know, that's godlike help, that's godlike aid. They're still concerned about the fact that the man is the primary one and the woman is being created second. That mm -hmm. still really bothers um, many of the students that I speak with. And so with that, I really try and push us more to say, okay, well, what does it mean? Like, why do we have this idea ever that being created first or being first in any way is better than being second mm -hmm. or being second is better than being first? Um, and I love just going into then even what Christ teaches us about this idea that the first shall be last, the last shall be first. And I think Christ is constantly trying to ask us to get out of these kind of preconceived notions and the way we look at things um, and to look at them differently. And so I think that's the answer to your question is, for all of us to stay, to have, take a step back and think, okay, how do I understand concepts? And is that the way that God is asking me to understand this? And am I reading my 21st century views onto something that really I should not be reading my 21st century views? Mm -hmm. And that really gets into, I think, why Mark and I really wanted to sit down and be a part of this podcast today is both of us feel very strongly that that's what reception history does for us. And this is why it matters to study how other people have looked at Scripture in the past is because it helps us to understand how Scripture and our understanding of Scripture is constantly evolving and changing, and how we're also so often limited by our own positionality and what we think of things. And so it's so useful to look at and say, okay, well, how do you understand Scripture? How do I understand Scripture? How did they understand Scripture in the past? Because it humbles us, mm -hmm. and it makes us think, okay, there's so many ways to interpret and to understand Scripture. And so I think Eve is just this great conversation and this great talking point because there's so many ambiguities in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and there's so many different ways to look at this text and understand this text. And you pointed out A's there, right? But there's so many other things that we can push through and say, okay, you can interpret it this way, you can interpret it that way. And so just more thinking of Scripture as this real dialogue with God, right? Like we read Scripture to strengthen our faith. And we read scripture to come to know God better. And I think if we're willing to sit in ambiguity and willing to sit with that there's different possibilities and ways to read this, um, then I think that really helps us, one, just connect better with God and get into a better place ourselves. Now, Mark, I want to steer the conversation towards you for just a second, um, because I think one of the stereotypes we have is that uh, Latter-day Saints have this positivistic view of Eve. And all other Christians don't, that, that they're negative towards her. You wrote an article called Reimagining and Reimaging Eve in Early Christianity that appears in a wonderful collection um, that you edited too called Material Culture and Women's Religious Experience in Antiquity. And one of the things that you found was that if, if we're using these broad stereotypes on the rest of our Christian brothers and sisters, they aren't quite accurate either. What's some of the complexity that you discovered in your research about the way other Christians have viewed Eve? Yeah, I um, I was fascinated to find out that uh, in early Christianity, there were more diverse views than I had in, uh, initially assumed. Uh, the patristic literature, the writings of the early Christian fathers, people like Tertullian, Origen, Augustine, et cetera, um, tended to view Eve pretty negatively uh, in one of three ways, uh, as the, the one who introduced sin and death into the world as sort of a, 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 a negative foil that compares uh, negatively with Christ or with Adam, and as uh, with Adam, the progenitor of the human race. And those are the three main themes that you see uh, in the, the male-authored uh, collection of early Christian literature, which is vast. But there are a few texts that we have from early Christianity that were either we know were authored by women 
or were influenced by women. And, uh, and those texts are really interesting. And as I read them, um, I also uh, was comparing them with images that I found on artifacts uh, from early Christianity that depicted Eve in some positive ways mm -hmm. and uh, that were more complex than what you found in the patristic literature. And uh, being a Latter-day Saint and being aware of the kind of creative thinking that early Latter-day Saint women were doing with with Eve, uh, it just struck me as fascinating. I started noticing it and kind of collecting it and compiling it, and finally it resulted in this conference paper and then an edited essay. Um, some of the things that I found were um, that in some of these ancient Christian texts, Eve is depicted as a teacher and an assertive speaker, and she teaches her family, she teaches humanity about the right way, about turning to God, about not turning away from goodness. And on uh, some artifacts, I saw Eve portrayed as a speaker. There was this one really beautiful little oil lamp that uh, an early Christian woman would have used uh, in her daily devotions as she lit that lamp at evening at a time for prayers in the home. Um, and it depicted Eve on the top of this lamp all by herself without Adam. And she's speaking, she's speaking. And so we have these literary traditions of Eve being a testifier, someone who speaks, someone who prays. And we have this artifact depicting, depicting Eve on a light bearing vessel, uh, making this gesture that indicates speech. And, and so I just became fascinated with what an ancient Christian woman might've seen in that image and how she might have interacted with the lamp. We also have texts uh, describing Eve as one who experiences divine communications and sees heavenly visions. And uh, on this one really beautiful sarcophagus from the fourth century that's now in Arles in France, there's the depiction of Eve conversing one-on-one -on -one with Christ, having her own conversation with Christ. Mm. And, uh, you know, being the recipient of divine communications on her own. In some of these ancient texts, there's uh, Eve is presented as a model of repentance and receiving salvation. And uh, one of the artifacts I studied is this really beautiful gold glass medallion about the size of a softball. And it's made of excised gold foil between two layers of glass. I think we're going to try to put some of these images yeah. on the Why Religion podcast yeah. website, right? So that people can actually look at what I'm talking about here. Uh, but there's this beautiful image of Eve and Adam and Christ standing next to Eve and extending his hand and sort of a, a staff that sort of represents the, the staff of Moses uh, that he used to uh, work wonders and miracles. And uh, uh, in early Christian art, Christ, the new Moses, is depicted uh, with his staff working miracles of transformation. And here is the one instance, I have not seen this anywhere else in early Christian art, where Christ is extending this transformative uh, symbol, uh, this miracle working symbol, to Eve. And so the image is saying Eve is redeemed, Eve is healed along with Adam. And it's depicted with other scenes of Christ working miracles, raising Lazarus, uh, healing the paralytic. And it's saying Eve too is a recipient of Christ's salvation. And uh, this would have been meaningful to the woman who owned this glass vessel. Uh, there's also ancient texts that talk about Eve as a devoted wife and a model of marital harmony. One of the poems written by an early Christian woman describes the marriage of Adam and Eve and them joining right hands, uh, which was one of the symbols of marital harmony in Roman art and Roman uh, marriage rituals. There's an a ancient uh, funerary plaque from Velletri in Italy that shows Adam and Eve joining right hands in marriage. And the emphasis is not on the fall, not on sin. It's on the two of them as a harmonious married couple. Uh, that too was important to early Christian women. I think what they were seeing is Eve in many instances as a model for piety in their own lives, which were kind of traditional lives uh, where they were married, raising children, trying to teach their children. And over and over again, they saw in Eve an archetype that they could relate to. So it feels like, um, and Amy, you introduced this wonderful term, mutuality, in describing the relationship between Adam and Eve. How, how do these principles affect how our students, particularly the young women, uh, see themselves and their role in the plan of salvation? 
Well, I think that's actually what my whole Woman in Scripture class is about, mm -hmm. is helping them to see that women have always been a key component of bringing forth the gospel of the gospel plan, um, that they are there in the scriptures. And it's really just because of what people have chosen to focus on and chosen to talk about that we don't recognize them as much. Um, and so honestly, for them, just seeing these different women um, and in their complexity, like that's kind of the point. And I love that you brought up, like, let's not put people on a pedestal because that's not useful. Mm -hmm. And honestly, like when we look at the Old Testament in particular, the Old Testament is putting basically no one on a pedestal. <laughs> These are all complex, messy individuals that God is working with. And that's the point of reading the Old Testament is saying, okay, wait a second, God can work through all of us in our messiness, in our complexity. He can use all of us. And for my students, so, so to like talk about even particular, but again, all women, them recognizing, okay, wait a second, they're there. God is using them. God needs them, um, again, in their strengths, their weaknesses, messing up, um, all of it, that that's who God needs. And that's and I think, again, I love the Old Testament. I think the Old Testament really is just this invitation to all of us to say, yes, well, let's be our complex selves and turn to God and see what God can make out of us. And so I just think bringing up and just recognizing Eve's role in this plan, that it is her and Adam there together at the beginning as a part of this, and then to walk through and see this throughout with all the patriarchs and the matriarchs, that it's always these individuals together. It is families that God is working with. I think that just helps uh, both men and women to recognize we're in this together. We are all needed, and God will again use all of us as we are just simply willing to be humble um, and to turn to Him. And you talk about us. Adam and Eve together at the beginning, and Latter day Saints have this wonderful capstone of a 1918 vision where Adam and Eve are together at the end. And Mark, your thoughts on the same question How do we use these images to, to help people understand the role of men and women in the plan of salvation? One of the things I love about what Amy just was saying is. Um, People are complex. The narratives that we encounter in the Old Testament are complex. Scripture is complex. And that helps us maybe deal with some of what you were mentioning a few minutes ago about, uh, you know, we have uh, more positive uh, statements about Eve in biblical reception history, but we also have some of these uh, negative statements we find in Scripture, Eve was deceived, etc. And one of the things that I love in the Book of Mormon is right on the title page where it says, if there are errors, they are the faults of man. Uh, so don't reject the things of God. Uh, you know, we, we are invited to be charitable readers, not only of the Book of Mormon, but of all scripture. And to recognize that the authors of scripture were complex as well. They were inspired, but they were also working within their own frameworks. And uh, we're invited into that conversation. Scripture is a conversation opener, not a conversation ender. It's like you were saying, Amy, uh, an invitation to reflect, to open us up, to think about what are the possibilities. And in, in ways that sort of opens our hearts to seek God more, to use Scripture as a way of seeking God rather than as a substitute for, for God. We can read these complex perspectives. Uh, we can think about them we can ask ourselves, okay, what does the Spirit now bring to my attention as I consider these? Maybe sometimes we'll recognize this is a scripture author reflecting their culture uh, in ways that maybe are corrected or moderated by other passages of scripture or other prophetic statements or other inspired people throughout history. Yeah, that helps me a lot in navigating all this. Yeah, so I think that's a perfect point, especially as we are entering this Old Testament year um, of study, is that we have to recognize that so often these people that we're going to be reading about, the scriptures are honestly like screaming to us, don't be like them. Mm -hmm. And yet sometimes because of how we've been trained as Latter-day Saints to maybe read particularly kind of the Book of Mormon, we want to kind of heroize everyone in this way that really keeps us from seeing what the scriptures are actually telling us. We'll make things that should not be, like that the scriptures are just condemning. We have a hard time recognizing that. I think, again, just being open to that, open to that complexity, but open to, as you pointed out, 
we are so removed. Um, and we have so many different voices happening in the Old Testament, which is fantastic. So it's going to give us so many different perspectives on, okay, how do I get to God? What is this journey going to look like? But recognizing, as you pointed out, that they are often contained by their space, by their time, by their culture, I think can really help us, as you said, read with charity. Um, and so I think as Ever I'm reading these difficult texts, I'm often thinking, okay, how do I get to God, right? Like, what is this teaching me in this moment of complexity? But recognizing that, yes, some of it is much more easily just kind of understood as a time and a place. And as you said, we're being modified by other scriptures or other things that can help us work through some of those difficult passages that we encounter. Rather than do a typical commercial break for something from BYU's Religious Studies Center here, I wanted to take a moment to thank you for listening and sharing and being part of the Why Religion podcast. If you can believe it, this is the start of our third season. Because of every one of you, there's been great response to the podcast, resulting in hundreds and thousands of downloads this past year. We even cracked the top 20 of religion and Christian podcasts in America a few times. And not just in America, by the way, I looked it up. We hit number 61 in Sweden and number 41 in Christian podcasts in Croatia. It's been great to see the overall response. Well, we are very excited for this 2022 season, beginning with the episode you're currently listening to on Mother Eve. And we've got other great episodes already recorded or lined up covering a broad range of topics, such as research on the complementary natures of mothers and fathers, the Abrahamic covenant, the Joseph Smith translation and Enoch, Christ's crucifixion, the Gethsemane cave or grotto, Joseph Smith's translation projects, spiritual gifts, the Book of Mormon's teachings on cursings and skin, how we approach the concept of church doctrine, and many more. I hope you are as excited about season three as I am, and we'll share that excitement with others. And we look forward to sharing another year with you as we seek to bring into one general place some of the recent publications and research from BYU religion professors, and to share it with the broader public in a podcast format to help enlighten and inspire the everyday seeker of truth. We've been listening to Professor Casey Griffiths interview Professor Amy Easton Flake and Professor Mark Ellison from BYU's Department of Ancient Scripture on reimagining our conceptions of Mother Eve. In part two of Why Religion, we explore why this research matters and how it might help the average saint to learn, live, and apply aspects of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. In this segment, Professors Ellison and Easton Flake will discuss some powerful thoughts on how we approach Scripture as conversation starters, not conversation enders, and on interpreting passages as prescriptive or descriptive. Here they are. Now, you've talked a lot about not using our 21st century lens uh, to, to affix our values, our expectations on these people that lived thousands of years ago. What are some tips that both of you would give to a reader of the scriptures to put off some of that presentism that sometimes colors our perception? That's such an important question when it comes to studying ancient scripture and religious history. Uh, I think uh, part of reading charitably, part of living out the Latter-day Saint aspiration to turn our hearts to our fathers and mothers, our spiritual ancestors of the past, is to try to understand them in their context, on their own terms. Um, and, and that requires doing some homework, learning about history, learning when it comes to studying the Old Testament, the Bible, learning about the ancient Near East, uh, the ancient world, and what the cultural uh, world was like for these people. And and that that doesn't necessarily mean we'll always then agree with them or, or heroize them, like you were saying, Amy, but, but we'll understand them more clearly, and then we'll be in a position to really discern better uh, what the scriptures are saying to us, what we can draw from them. Thank you. I could not agree more with that comment. It's so important for us to take the time to try and study some history, some culture, some background to understand them better. It's amazing how many times once we do have just a little bit of context and history that a story actually is completely different than what we thought um, and sometimes the exact opposite of what we're thinking. But also for me, I think trying to go into the text, recognizing that that I don't know everything. Mm -hmm. 
um, and recognizing. That's why, again, as we've been talking about, I think reception history, reading interpretations of the past from different people can just be so useful to opening us up to thinking my reading is not the only reading. But then the other thing is really going at the text with a fresh perspective and with a fresh eye and really allowing the text to speak itself. And so that for a moment turns us back to the story, right, with Adam and Eve in the garden, is that there's actually just so much ambiguity in the text that we don't recognize a lot of times with Latter-day Saints because we think, oh, I know this story. But when we turn back to the story, we suddenly recognize, okay, there's nothing said in here about Eve's or Adam's motive for mm-hmm. partaking of the fruit. That's that's not there. Um, actually, when we read the text, we don't know, was Adam there when Eve partook of the fruit? Was he not there? Um, it opens up new questions of, okay, again, in this text, the only one who ever speaks to the serpent is Eve. So maybe what does that mean for her to be the spokesperson for the couple? And so just thinking again that there's so much in the text itself that I would just challenge everyone with this year of reading the Old Testament to just really read it um, and just look at each word and just just read carefully, <laughs> not thinking, oh, I've heard this story before. Oh, I already know what this is happening. But to let yourself be surprised by the text, because this text really will surprise you if you just read with an open perspective towards it. Mark, you used a phrase, conversation starters, not conversation enders. I think sometimes we're used, to, uh, we're accustomed to using scripture as a hammer, you know, to end the conversation, here's what it says. Uh, you're suggesting it, it's not the end, it should be open. Like like Amy's pointing out, there's a lot of ambiguity, and sometimes that gives us different avenues to explore this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I love that metaphor of scripture and religious history, religious tradition as a long conversation. For me, that makes me feel like I'm invited into the conversation. I need to hear all the different voices. Uh, yes, we're all united in our love of God, our aspiration to follow God, uh, to be faithful. And yet we'll all have different experiences, perspectives, and we need that. It's like a testimony meeting in our church where we hear um, different perspectives, different stories, different people's life experiences, each one with their own truth to tell. And we're richer as a result. And scripture is like a huge testimony meeting collected over thousands of years uh, with lots of perspectives. On what you were just saying, Amy, I love that idea of flipping the script a little bit. letting the ambiguities open some conversation and open some question. If I can just share one quote from one of the ancient texts I studied. Sure. Um, this is really interesting. Uh, the, uh, the, in, in early Christianity, that many of the patristic fathers were quite negative about Eve. And here's a text that uh, we don't know who authored it, but it seems to have come from a community uh, where women were of special influence. It's called Irenaeus Fragment 14. It's not by Irenaeus, but it seems to be from a Christian group um, that Irenaeus opposed. And here's, I'll just read the quote. Why did the serpent not attack the man rather than the woman? You say he went after her because she was the weaker of the two. On the contrary, in the transgression of the commandment, she showed herself to be the stronger. Truly the man's help, uh, there's that word help, is there. Uh, For she alone stood up to the serpent. She ate from the tree, but with resistance and dissent after being dealt with perfidiously. But Adam took, uh, partook of the fruit given by the woman without even beginning to make a fight, without a word of contradiction. The woman, moreover, can be excused. She wrestled with a demon and was thrown. Uh, and so that's just a part of the the paragraph there, but you can see, uh, not that we would necessarily agree wholesale with what uh, this text is saying, but what they're doing is conversing and saying, aren't there some other possibilities in how we read this? You know, if Eve was the one speaking with the serpent, then what are some different ways we can think about that? Um, and I love what you said, Amy, about being surprised by scripture. Uh, say, the words Satan the fall, sin, transgression, they don't even come up in Genesis 1 through 3. Mm -hmm. That's later biblical reception. That's uh, 2 Nephi 2, 2 Nephi 9, and and 2,000 years of Christian history. But right there in the story, it's not there. And so it's an opportunity for us to kind of 
bracket, set aside for a moment, other things, and just kind of take that story as, uh, as it comes to us and say, what might this have meant to ancient Israelites? Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to actually, go before you yeah. go on to a different question, one other thing that I think is absolutely essential of just like the scripture skills, right, of what we're trying to say of kind of having, taking away a 21st century lens and whatnot, is this idea of recognizing that sometimes scripture is prescriptive and sometimes scripture is descriptive. And that is just one tool that I lay out for all of my students whenever they take a scripture class for me, because it helps us to deal with so many different issues and particularly then to bring it back to Eve that we're talking about right here, we have a moment, of course, of what we've termed the curse, although, of course, the curse doesn't, as you mentioned, Mark, doesn't actually come up in Genesis 1 to 2. But we have the moment, right, where it says, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So this is a moment where you have to think, is this a prescriptive passage? Mm -hmm. Meaning, is God right here saying, this is how I want things to be. This is the way things are. And for many years, thousands of years, many people have read this as a prescriptive scripture. And it's been used to, again, justify so many horrors and so many terrors that right. have been inflicted on women and on children. But instead, you can also read this as a descriptive passage, meaning that God is not intending this. He does not want this to happen, but he's saying, I know what a fallen world is going to look like. I know that in a fallen world, men are going to, because of different strains and whatever, they will take advantage of my daughters. I know this is going to happen. And so we see this here as a warning to Eve of what will happen in a fallen world and what she is going to face. And I think just that idea in scripture is so useful because it's happening all over the place. And a lot of times when you as a reader of the scripture, you might be uncomfortable with what's happening. A lot of times if you'll just take a step back and say, okay, is this a prescriptive passage? Is this God describing what he wants? Is this the prophets describing what they want? Or is this really just a descriptive passage of saying, okay, this is God or the prophets describing this is just what it is to be in a fallen world. Um, and I share that one insight because that has been one that has just been so useful for all of my students when I've shared that. And in particularly to recognize right here that I definitely don't believe that this is God prescribing this on Eve, but that this is him describing this is a fallen world. This is what is going to happen. And again, you can once again just see this move being made by many of the 19th century women that I've read that they're like, oh, no, you're mis they're mistranslating this. It's not will, it's shall, and just making different moves of saying that this is instead a descriptive passage and recognizing that this is one way that so many women throughout time have worked with this to kind of get to a closer understanding of what they see as their relationship with their heavenly parents. And that passage is a great example of the reader impressing their own values onto what God is saying there. Is he mm -hmm. cursing them or is he telling them how it's going to be? Um, a lot of our own personal baggage comes to that, and maybe we need to abandon that along the way. If you're interested in Professor Ellison's article on reimagining and re-imaging Eve in early Christianity, published in the 2021 book Material Culture and Women's Religious Experience in Antiquity, we've included a link to that book on our website at whyreligion.byu.edu. We've also included links to some of the images of Eve that Professor Ellison discussed during this podcast episode. On our website, you can also read more about Professor Ellison and Easton Flake, as well as get access to links of articles from past episodes. Well, we've arrived at part three, our final segment of this Why Religion podcast. Here, we typically talk a little bit about the professor's academic journey that brought them to BYU and about their own personal faith. But since Dr. Easton Flake and Dr. Ellison are both returning guests to the podcast, and they've discussed that in previous Why Religion episodes, and by the way, I'd recommend you go listen to their other episodes if you haven't, we're going to take a little different approach here. Let me give you a quick recap first of their credentials. Amy Easton Flake received her PhD in American literature with an emphasis in 19th century women's literature and narrative theory from Brandeis University. She centers her research on 19th century women's reform literature, 19th century women's biblical interpretation, and reception history of the Book of Mormon through a narrative lens. 
She and her husband, Merrill, are the parents of two children. Mark Ellison received a PhD and master's degree from Vanderbilt University in early Christianity and early Christian art. He also studied New Testament Greek at St. Petersburg Theological Seminary and has done archaeological field work at Bethsaida and also the Hukok excavations near the Sea of Galilee. His research focuses on intersections of early Christian texts, artifacts, iconography, and practices. He and his wife Lauren have five children. With that background, in part three, these great scholars are going to share a little bit with our listeners some insights about how they approach their own study of the scriptures and how it strengthens them in the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. For the last part of our discussion, uh, we always get a little personal with the people that we're talking to. Uh, I'd like to ask you today, um, your study methodology, how you study the scriptures, and how the scriptures help you stay strong uh, in your faith. So, uh, Mark, why don't we allow you to go first, and then Amy, if you could answer the same question. I I love uh, the restoration. I The more I learn about it, the more I fall in love with it. And uh, one of the things, uh, one of the concepts in the restoration that just helps me so much in my scripture study, in the continuing development of my faith, is this idea that Um, the restoration is about gathering up all truth, all goodness, all light and beauty scattered throughout the world. I love how in 2 Nephi 29, verse 7, and Alma 29, verse 8, the Lord says, you know, don't you know there's more nations than one? I speak to them all. The Lord gives to every nation uh, all that he sees fit that they should have. And so we should expect as seekers to find God all over, uh, working in people's lives, doing his redemptive work, revealing himself. And uh, especially in the church where we have uh, uh, so much scripture and uh, ongoing revelation and a, a, a community that's aspiring to build Zion, we'll find a lot, but we'll also find it everywhere. And so for me, I, I, I search far and wide. Uh, as I study scripture, I use study Bibles prepared by scholars who have devoted their whole lives to studying biblical languages and and history and culture that that helps me understand ancient scripture better. I, I use commentaries. I I read the thoughts of religious people of other traditions, and and they sometimes articulate things in ways that I have just not seen, uh, and so it is all enriching to me. I I love the idea in the Doctrine and Covenants about seeking out of the best books and becoming more perfectly instructed in in history and things in the earth and under the earth and things that have been kingdoms and nations and perplexities of nations. Uh, Doctrine and Covenants 88, 78 through 80 and some cognate passages elsewhere. And that to me uh, is feels like a calling. That that's what I feel uh, called to do in my scripture study. Um, A friend of mine once uh, was talking with me. He's Romanian Orthodox, and he and I were talking about faith and reason. And he said, uh, he said, the eye of faith and the eye of reason work together to give us our depth of vision. They each balance and correct, check and balance the, the excesses of the other, and they work together. I have found that in my own religiosity. I, I have not found a conflict so much as a synergy there. And uh, in my own pursuit of academic learning, um, sometimes I've had to make readjustments. Sometimes I've felt moments of spiritual vertigo, uh, but they were less faith crisis than just an adjustment. Uh, I've had to lose nothing except just some faulty assumptions, some stereotypes, some narrow thinking, and that's what we all have to lose, right? So uh, those are some things that have helped me to stay strong, to help me feel like I'm continuing to grow uh, in my spiritual life. Amy, same question. How do you study and how does it help you stay strong? I love everything that Mark just said. I That's just so beautifully put. Um, I completely agree. It is by just taking taking the time to search and to, one, come to the scriptures, having, honestly, like, it is so essential to pray. Um, for me before I begin studying the scriptures. It's so essential for me to 
have a format, whether that be a scripture journal, whether that be I'm like taking notes on my, you know, iPad, whatever, um, but that I am really just open to what am I going to learn this time? But similar to Mark, I I go everywhere in my scripture study. I'm constantly reading so many commentaries on different um, topics by just a whole host of people who have you know, read and studied and learned about these topics because it does, it expands my knowledge. And so then when I go to the scriptures, I feel like that allows the spirit to then speak to me and help me to receive new insights that I wouldn't have seen other places. And for me, Joseph Smith is honestly the best example of this, right? Like he ranged the world looking for new insights and new ways, and then he would bring them to bear on scripture and on his revelation. And I think that's why we have so much of the information that we have is because he was insatiable in his search for knowledge. And I know I just want to be that same way. And I feel like my scripture study so improves when I'm willing to grab things from every source and bring it all to bear then on the scriptures. And for me, like one idea that's like really held strong for me is an idea that Adam Miller put forth in one of his beautiful books that he's written on theology and on scripture is he says, we know we've done it right, meaning scripture study, if it calls us to repentance meaning that it urges us to change. It urges us to want to be better. And so I love that because I just think, yes, like scripture study can look so different for so many people, but you know you've done it right if you're being motivated to change, if you're being motivated to be better. Um, And that's why I love looking at scripture as just this invitation for me to have a conversation um, with God, have a conversation with our heavenly parents and to feel that when I read text, if like I if something doesn't sit well with me, well then I study it more and I try and like dive in to say, okay, this is complex. And again, I bring this up because encountering in the Old Testament, you have just so many more things that you're like, what? What happened here? How is this, how is this occurring? But as I then take the time to read other commentaries, to read other people's thoughts on it, and then to again be influenced by the spirit, then I find that all of these things can just work together in these texts that are difficult and hard are often the ones that for me are my favorite. They are the ones that inspired me to change in some way that made me want to be better. And I think it's that struggle. Um, And so I think that's why the Old Testament is just this great invitation for us to really come to know God better as we just kind of work through this. Um, And so I think just being open to complexity, being open to all of that just really helps me stay strong as I read scriptures and make sure that scripture reading, I love, as I know Mark does as well, being able to be a professor in the ancient scripture department at BYU is the greatest job in the world because it is amazing to get to teach this, to get to help people think about these different things and to spend so much time just immersed in this world of scripture. It always builds my faith as I just take the time to learn and to just digest new material. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat, the host and producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from BYU Religious Education, professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, Ryan Sharp, and Hank Smith. Recording, mixing, and original music was done by BYU student Mitchell Bashford. Say hi, Mitchell. Hi, guys. Original music and scoring for Why Religion Podcast was also created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.